I know uh, people are continuing to, to drop in here and um, we're excited to have you join us again and thank you for uh, joining us via Zoom. I know people are starting to get pretty tired of it, but we are thrilled that we can still see you and still be with you at least in this way. So thank you so much um, for, for coming today. Um, I, I did want to also, you know, hope that everyone's staying healthy and safe and uh, we do look forward to getting to see you in person as soon as we can. Um, our team has been working hard though to continue to connect with you online uh, through our social media, through First Thursdays, uh, Scorecard Workday, and our, of course our Oklahoma Green Living page, our new page. Um, we have new additions that keep going up on there and, and we're collecting some of the ones from First Thursday events uh, to add to that page. Um, we also just uh, shared the results of the scorecard final event, which we had last week. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, keep in touch with our website. We keep updating it with some, some good information. But uh, in regards to that Oklahoma Green Living page, this is um, you know one of the things we launched on Earth Day this year. And it was a way to really connect our community around green living practices. And it's also an easy way to help support Sustainable Tulsa. It's a $25 donation. You get your name on there and you show the rest of Oklahoma and the world that this is um, you know, important to you and important to this community to have access to education and a connection of a community around living green in um, Oklahoma. So uh, please, uh, take a moment and I think uh, Megan will add a link in there where you can support us there. Uh, we'd love to have add your name to that list. Um, you also see that we're going to be putting out some polls uh, this, uh, this time, just asking a couple of questions throughout the event. Please take a moment to answer those uh, for us and uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, also wanted to thank, of course, our sponsors uh, today, um, American Waste Control, Cavanta, Grog Screen Barn, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Error Systems, TCC Center for Creativity, PSO, and PSO Wind Choice. Uh, give them a virtual clap and thank them for their support. And if you know any one of those organizations, thank them for supporting us because it truly is the way we're able to continue to present our first Thursday program. So we do appreciate so much their support. Um, also, uh, my board members have been amazing this year in supporting us. And I, I just uh, wanted to thank uh, those that were able to join us today. So give a wave when I call your name, but uh, uh, Nadia Kirilova, Mike Lemus, Connor Carroll, Aaron Larder, uh, Michael Teague, Rick Katarski, Stephanie Cameron, Carrie Rowland, and Pam Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us today and your leadership and uh, for this year. It's been um, quite a year for us. Um, and of course, I also want to uh, thank uh, my team, my amazing team, Sarah Hicks, give a wave, uh, our scorecard coordinator, Jill Maud, our office specialist, and of course, Megan Hurley, who helped put together an uh, event together. Um, she's been busy because we also are putting together our recharge and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So uh, give them a virtual round of uh, gratitude. Um, and as mentioned earlier, again, our Oklahoma Green Living page is a way to you know, add your um, commitment to sustainability and it's a way to also connect and learn about uh, experts out there. So. Uh, you can reach that um, through our website at sustainabletulsainc.org backslash okgreenliving. So check out the resources. Let us know what else we need to have on there. What, what would you like to know more about? And if there's experts that you're aware of that we should be adding, uh, please let us know. Uh, also, next week is our big annual recharge fundraiser. It will be held Thursday, September 10th from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, because it's a virtual event, uh, we changed the time and um, it's, we've got some little surprises at this event. You can still buy tickets, you can still sponsor. Um, but we also um, opened up the silent auction uh, today, this morning. So you can start bidding. There's some amazing um, packets in there and baskets to bid on. You can also become an Oklahoma Green Living Page uh, member on there as well. Uh, and I wanna say a big thank you to my board who was so instrumental in putting these packets together and to Pam Taylor for chairing Recharge this year. Uh, thank you, Pam. 
Um, the board was so generous to um, help purchase these baskets um, because so many of our local businesses are struggling. And so this year, we instead of ask for uh, too many donations, we um, we purchased some baskets so that we could uh, put together this. Uh, silent auction uh, for our event. So my, again, a big round of applause to my board for their generous support. And there's some great baskets. So start bidding. You can start doing that now. And I think uh, Megan will add in, in the chat there has already uh, about that. So uh, thank you. Uh, Megan, did I miss anything about recharge? You want to make sure that I have added today? And did you mention the giveaway? Oh, uh, no, please. <laughs> Uh, mention that for us. Oh, okay. I, I, sorry, I can't see you guys right now, but I, I, we are giving away two tickets to recharge uh, today. So um, as long as you registered for the event, uh, we will uh, be drawing a name uh, out of the number of people that are registered, and then we will be announcing the winner at the end of the event. So please uh, stay on for just that final moment at the end and we'll and maybe we'll announce your name okay great thank you okay and now to introduce dr ann many um Corey, it's my pleasure yes we have our uh our uh, uh booths really quickly we had oh, some yeah. okay please. let's do that <laughs> so sorry about that uh, so we have uh, PSO and PSO Win Choice, our uh, sponsors for First Thursday. We wanted just to remind you guys about Win Choice. It's a fantastic program. In fact, Corey, did you want to mention anything about the Win Choice uh, uh, giveaway that we have coming up at Recharge? Yeah, we'll be announcing that at the event. But if you sign up or already signed up as a Win Choice uh, member, you have an opportunity to win this great basket uh, of items, and we'll have that uh, available at Recharge to show that to you uh, virtually. Um, but um, it's about a five hundred dollar value basket to win just by signing up uh, to power your home with wind, and it's easy to do. And uh, we'll, we'll share how to get, make that happen. So we'll make that announcement recharge. So thank you to uh, PSO and Win Choice program uh, for helping, helping out because we want more and more of our members um, powering their homes with wind because that helps to make our event uh, more carbon friendly. Yay. Okay. And then we also have American Waste Control. Uh, they uh, also have added wood recycling. Uh, so it's a really great program. If you're wanting more information, please contact American Waste Control again. Amanda Curtis down here at the bottom, a Amanda at awcok.com. Uh, so thank you guys at American Waste Control. And then Ali, you are on if you want to give your update for the Met. Hi, yes, we, um, are still talking about the uh, RecycleThisTulsa.com, which is our online directory. But then we also have a couple of our fall events coming up. We have two tire and e-waste collection events. One is going to be in Collinsville on October 3rd from 9 to 12. And then one is going to be October 10th at the Tulsa Zoo from 9 to 12 as well. And then we are going to have a prescription drug take back event with um we're coordinating with a lot of different places so we won't be the only place accepting them but our central location on sheridan will be accepting um prescription drugs to take back from 10 a.m to 2 p.m on october 24th awesome thank you so much uh, and then our next sponsor is uh city of tulsa save our streams program if you'd like more information on that please go to cityoftulsa.org it's a fantastic program. Usually you see Dustin sitting uh, at his table with some seed giveaways and, and other cool things. So um, please check it out. Uh, Dustin would be happy to talk to you more about the program. And then Rick, you have an update from Monarch Initiative. Yes, so um, obviously with COVID this year, Monarchs on the Mountain has had to pivot and we are going mobile. So it's Monarchs on the Mountain 2020 Mobile Edition. And so uh, as you can see as the poster there, it's basically gonna be celebrating the Eastern Oklahoma's vital role in the amazing monarch butterfly migration. And so this, uh, all the information I'm getting ready to tell you will be available on both the River Park Authority's 
Facebook event page as well as Sustainable Tulsa's Monarch Initiative Tulsa um, page. And so um, there are going to be uh, lots of activities going on. It officially starts from 10 to 2, but realistically it's an all-day thing because you could go to these sites and click on different things and see a different content. Um, so during this whole period, um, anything that's going to be outdoors is going to be under the social distancing and precautions will be used and mandatory for all non-online content. So some of the things that will be available will be planting. So Tulsa Master Gardeners will have a program uh, about planting fall gardens and native plants. There'll be planting opportunities at different gardens and habitats around town. They can go and purchase plants and then donate those plants and have them planted at the site. Um, the garden center at Wilbur Park will provide plants that will be planted by people who sign up to do that to that program. And it's obviously limited by how many people uh, can do this at one time. And there's different time slots that you can sign up for. Uh, Riverfield Country Day School for Education Components is going to be doing a video that will be uh, instructional on how to capture um, net and tag and then release monarch butterflies. There will be six sites that the community can go through uh, uh, and visit the uh, different way stations from North Tulsa all the way to South Tulsa. Each site will have educational signs explaining six phases of monarchs and as they journey south back to Mexico from Canada as they travel through Tulsa. And then there'll be some on, lots of online content. Um, TCCL, Tulsa City County Library, has produced two special book lists for adults and children about pollinators, monarchs, and gardening, as well as a seed list available at the seed library that coincides with the plants described in some of the books. And of course, there'll be lots of online resources and information about monarchs, pollen, and gardening, Blue Thumbs Yard Yard Program, City of Tulsa Save Our Streams, Master Gardeners, Okies for Monarchs, Sustainable Tulsa and Monarch Initiative, and many more of our supporting organizations. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm That's so a lot of information. <laughs> it is. And I'll be posting a link to the flyer here in just a moment. So if you guys want more information, you can follow that link. Uh, and then we will be updating our website as well. So thank you so much for uh, getting that together. I'm so glad it's happening again this year. So uh, Corey, back over to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors uh, for your updates on what you're working on. This is, you know, uh, uh, First Thursday has been that hub for so many years now, and I'm glad we're able to continue to offer that virtually for you all. So thank you for sharing about all the good work you're continuing to do. Um, Again, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Money. Uh, she has, um, uh, we've, it's been a delight to get to know Anne over the years and, and the work that she's doing. Uh, so um, can't wait. And I also want to just mention, uh, mention as, as people were uh, coming online that her uh, past presentation is also on our website and it was about plastics in the ocean. And it was very, um, uh, very impactful and we've uh, continued to have so many people uh, share with us uh, uh, how much they enjoyed that presentation. So uh, today I'm excited to hear about her own personal research. Um, the state of our coral reefs is one of the most ecologically important issues of the day and Dr. Ann Money has been exploring that and the functionality of coral biofluorescence and how it can be utilized to restore the vitality of our failing reefs. Ann recently earned a doctorate in integrated biology from Oklahoma State University studying biofluorescence and coral reefs with funding through the National Science Fa Foundation Fellowship. Currently, Anne is continuing and expanding her coral research to include how to identify and utilize harder coral, I'm sure she'll talk about that, for replanting upon wild reef systems. She recently traveled to Israel where she collaborated with the biologists from the um, Gutzerman uh, Family Israel Aquarium in uh, Jerusalem and uh, regarding potential cooperative coral research. While there, she dove in the Red Sea observing coral biofluorescence and conducts her research at the Oklahoma Aquarium and utilizes the opportunity to share relevant coral research in action with thousands of school children annually. In her spare time, Anne is an avid scuba diver. She loves spending time outdoors with her three children and traveling as much as time allows. So, Please welcome Anne Money. Thank you so much, everybody. Give me just one moment. Uh, let's see. All right. 
Okay, can everybody see? Yep, okay. So first of all, I want to thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to come and show you my slideshow of my vacation. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. But to share what we've been doing here at the aquarium and uh, how we're trying to expand that globally and, and uh, just take what we're doing here and, and make it as impactful as we as we possibly can. So in December, it seems like a lifetime ago, <laughs> that was just pre-COVID, but in December, our uh, head marine aquarist, Amy Alexopoulos and I traveled to Israel and uh, we were able to work with people from the aquarium there. And I'll go into a lot more detail about that, but I think that everybody would agree with me on this, I, I hope, that um, zoos and aquariums have a very specific role, and that role is not just to keep animals in captivity. That role is to inspire wonder and excitement in science and the natural world, and it, it, it's been proven that the best way to, um, to excite people and to, to get them to grow up and want to be more involved in, in STEM fields and in conservation and in sustainability is to really instill that sense of wonder as children and when they're kids. And so that's what we want to do every day uh, at the aquarium and at the zoo and at any zoo or aquarium is that you just want you want to see that that little boy with his mouth open and wonder and that's that's what this is all about and that's why we do what we do so this is the entrance to the Cottesman family Israel Aquarium and it is in Jerusalem and it's on the same property as the Jerusalem Biblical Zoo they are our sister aquarium and we have a very long history with them about a decade ago, the then director of the Jerusalem Zoo came here to Oklahoma and said, okay, I've done all this research and you guys are the closest to what we want to do. So he wanted an aquarium and he came here and he said, I want you to do for me there what you did here. And the things that we really have in common was a tiny budget <laughs> comparatively for an aquarium and also being inland. So not having an open water source uh, where you can pull water in from like Monterey Bay is an open water system. So some of our staff actually designed the entire aquarium and it was a, a, a several years long process, but they opened about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and I will say um, we're very proud of this. They are the first freestanding inland aquarium in the Middle East. So they were something just completely new for the region and, and so very, very exciting. So this is Amy, and this is a lot, a lot of what she did during our visit. We've been here for 20 years. We're still a baby aquarium, even at 20 years, but they've only been around about two, three years. So we wanted to go over there and share knowledge, share information. Um, they've sent people here before to, to work with us and we wanted to go there to work with them. So Amy spent a lot of time in the tanks, looking at the tanks, looking at the filtration and trying to exchange information and help in any way that, that she could and we could. Um, where, from filtration, life support systems to the husbandry of the animals. So keeping the tanks a certain way, feeding them, feeding them more, feeding them less, whatever the case may be. Um, and that's a little spiny lobster you see with her and it's incredibly beautiful, I think. So if you've been to the Oklahoma Aquarium, and if you ever have the privilege to go to the Israel Aquarium, you'll, you'll notice some similarities because the same people designed our aquarium as designed their aquarium. And this is an artificial reef and you can pop up in the center of it. So you feel like you're in the reef system and you're underwater. And that's very similar to our Amazon exhibit where you can pop up in the middle of the Amazon and be surrounded by iguanas and fish. And it's supposed to be just a very immersive experience. And again, going back to instilling that wonder in children, really that exp experiential learning and that being able to actually feel like you're a part of it has the biggest impact. So that's what's going to instill that sense of wonder more than, more than anything. 
So this is me with their director of education, Shai ben -Ami, and we were talking about um, just ways to impact kids when they came through the door, ways to bring as many students through as you possibly can so you can, you can have that, that influence on as, as many people as possible, how to use their biofacts, and just really how to communicate that, that, um, that message of sustainability and conservation. Um, and I learned so much from them, which was really, really thrilling. But one of the things that we discussed and that we're, we're going to launch is here at the aquarium in, in Jinx, we have been doing research on the impact of a field trip to an aquarium on a student's interest in STEM and their interest in conservation, whether you can see a couple of the questions here. I think science is fun. I want a job in STEM. I can make a difference for a healthy environment. It was really trying to gauge as students came in how confident were they in their ability to study, to research in their knowledge about science and whether they thought it was fun, whether it was something that they liked. And then we compared that with when they left. And uh, luckily, <laughs> they were more excited about science when they left than when they got here. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but it, what was really interesting to me was uh, as the students were coming in that data, and overwhelmingly, uh, the students who had a lower sense of confidence and interest, it was based on socioeconomic status. And so that's really a bridge that we can hopefully try to gap here in, in our region. But we're gonna send this survey over to Jerusalem and work with them. And for me, it, it bolsters the data, it gives um, an international component to what we're doing. And for them, it gives them some concrete uh, feedback on the way that, that they are, are, are uh, disseminating information. So the most fascinating thing to me when it came to the education portion of it was they have a very difficult job. They have to cater to and communicate three completely different populations. So every graphic in the facility was in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And as they were explaining to me, it's not just a matter of translation of the words. It's translation of the dissemination of the words. So all the three different populations, uh, they take information in differently. They process information differently. And they have to cater to all of that. They have to make sure that they are giving the same impactful message to each of the three groups of people. And so for them to have a gauge of, am, am I getting across in the same way to all three groups and am I making the same impact on all three would just be so helpful for them and so interesting to learn and maybe find better ways on both sides to, to get this information across. So this is their coral tank, their live coral tank, and uh, this is it a little bit more close up. They are not healthy. This is not healthy coral. All of these coral were confiscated from the Tel Aviv airport and they were being smuggled. Uh, so yeah, where they put it, I don't know, but they were obviously carrying bags of water with coral in it and I guess thought they wouldn't get caught, but all of this is confiscated coral. And the reason that people want this Red Sea coral is that it is the hardiest coral in the world. Myself included, researchers from all over the world go to the Northern Red Sea, uh, the Sea of Aqaba, in order to study why these coral tend to survive more so than coral in other parts of the world. Um, part of it is that it's cooler in the northern, in the, in the Sea of Aqaba and the Northern Red Sea and the sea surface temperatures have been rising a little bit more slowly. So the algae that lives inside the coral has had more time to adapt to the, to the increase in temperature. But we wanna know how they're doing that, that in and of itself. How are they adapting? Because it's still very, very rapid. But that's why people, a lot, I mean, a lot of it is, is maybe hobbyist, but a lot of people want that coral to know, um, to know what's going on over there. So uh, out on reef systems, uh, there's a phenomena called bleaching. And what's happening during a bleaching event 
is that the sea surface temperatures increase. They, they, they get, they're getting hotter and hotter with climate change. It's just, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, it only takes about a one or two degrees Celsius increase in temperature for a bleaching event to start. What happens when a coral bleaches is I was talking about that symbiotic algae that it has inside of its tissues. Well, it starts over photosynthesizing because it breaks down with the heat. And so what ends up happening is you have the coral actually will spit out the algae. So what you're seeing there is a coral spitting out algae out of its mouth because it's stressed. And that's what's happening when bleaching is occurring. And this is it under fluorescence, by the way, and we'll talk more about fluorescence uh, here in a moment. But when the algae is expelled from the coral, it's, it takes about 90% of the energy with it that the coral needs to survive. Um, it also takes the color. So the color of a coral reef is not from the animal itself. It's actually from that symbiotic algae and fluorescent and non-fluorescent proteins. So color producing or light producing proteins. So that's actually the mouth of the coral that you're looking at there. And that's under um, excitation light. And I'll talk about that more in a moment, but that is actually algae that that coral is, is actively spitting out. So why do we care? What's, uh, what's the point of me talking to you in Oklahoma about coral reefs? Um, and I'm sure everybody in this group understands the value of this, but um, we have as much of an impact from here in Tulsa as you do from anywhere in the world. Um, and not to pander, but I'm gonna be honest with you, the best thing that you can possibly be doing, that I can possibly be doing, is being involved with organizations like this, uh, maintaining that sustainable lifestyle, promoting sustainability in a community, is what is gonna have the biggest impact on things like coral reefs. So coral are valued, I've heard anywhere between 800 billion and 16 trillion US dollars annually. Um, part of that is from medications that are taken from the reef and we're losing, we've lost about 50% of our reefs already. Um, so we're losing all that potential for new medicines, um, cancer medications. And in fact, uh, even the fluorescence, they've identified fluorescent proteins that they use to fight brain cancer now. Um, tourism, that's what most people think about. Um, anybody who's ever been able to go to, a, to an area with a reef, it's amazing and you scuba dive and you snorkel or you just lay on the beach and enjoy the crystal clear water. So tourism's a huge driver, a huge financial driver. But coral reefs are also the most biodiverse habitat in the world. Some people might argue with me and say it's the Amazon, but I stick by that. Um, they cover less than, reefs cover less than 1% of the planet, but they're home to 25% of all marine life. 30% of every identified fish in the world lives on a coral reef at some point in, it, in its life. Um, you guys have probably all seen Finding Nemo, and if you have young children back about, you know, 15 years ago, you've seen it a lot. Um, I still don't get tired of it, but that is what a reef is. It's a nursery ground. It's a place for little fish to be safe within the nooks and crannies of the reef and have the ability to get bigger, get to a size that they're not just going to immediately be eaten when they swim off the reef. Well, those fish that go from the little fish to the big fish are fish that we like to eat and we like to catch. And so we're not seen as many fish that are available for commercial fisheries, both from overfishing, but also from loss of, of reef systems. And that is so important for us as humans because 40% of this planet relies on the ocean as its main source of protein. So you wipe out those fish populations, you are affecting 40% um, of this planet and their food supply. So that's a big part of the value of the reef. But the biggest value, and this is one people don't often think about, is shoreline protection. So with climate change, with that increased sea surface temperature, you're getting bigger storms and they're happening more rapidly. So you're seeing bigger and bigger hurricanes and typhoons and they're coming back to back to back. That's a lot of energy for our coastlines to have to absorb. So what happens when you have these big, huge storms, that energy 
comes barreling towards the coastline. Well, if you have a nice strong reef system, that wave energy hits that reef and the reef absorbs about 97% of that energy before it slams on the shoreline, um, causing erosion, causing flooding, all of these things that we're seeing a lot more regularly now. Uh, the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta, they're having to move it. They're actually moving the whole capital inland because it's, it's underwater, it's flooding all the time. So that's why we care about <laughs> reefs or, and also just because they're beautiful, but um, that's why it matters. No matter where you are on the planet, you are affected by reef systems and it is important for all of us to um, do the things that we should be doing anyway, that we should be doing for all of our habitats and all of our ecosystems. Um, this is just part of that. It's just another one of those ecosystems that needs protecting. So the research that we do here at the aquarium, my little tiny lab that my friend calls a Japanese apartment because it's very, very small, but I study um, fluorescence within coral. So you saw that picture of the fluorescent coral expelling the algae. Um, what I look at is um, fluorescence as a sign of an early indicator of a decline in coral health. There's a few other things I look at too, but I'm gonna focus more on that. And what fluorescence is, is um, it's just a mechanical process for creating light. So bioluminescence, like a firefly, is a chemical reaction. And biofluorescence is an actual physical reaction where um, a fluorophore absorbs light at one wavelength, scatters it, re-emits it, and it happens to be really beautifully brilliant when the light absorbed is in the UV range. Well, this is happening all around us. We fluoresce every, I mean, if you were to look around you, if you had the rods and cones to do it, you could see that everything around you fluoresces. Unfortunately, we don't have those rods and cones, but fish do and coral reefs glow brilliantly. So the animals that live on a reef can see it. We just can't unless we have special lights and filters. So if we have an excitation light that gets those uh, fluorescent proteins all excited, they re-emit that light. And if we have that yellow filter, it blocks out the reflected blue light. So that's, that's what I'm looking at in coral is that, that fluorescence. Because it tells me a lot about what's going on. It tells me a, an entirely different story than what you see with the naked eye. And I should back up a bit and say, coral research didn't really start in earnest until the 1980s. So it's every discovery that you make really is a lot of the time a first time discovery. Um, people don't think about the fact that if you look at coral under fluorescence, you might be seeing something totally different. And to illustrate that here is, it's an echinophilia, it's one of my model species. And if you look at it under the natural light, you see it's, it's brown, it's not white, it doesn't look bleached, I would think that's a healthy coral. But then I excite the fluorescent proteins and I look at it that way and I'm told a very, very different story. So the green that you're seeing is the fluorescence of the coral. That's what you want to see, nice, healthy, strong fluorescence. The red that you're seeing is actually the red fluorescence of the algae. So what I know now from looking at it under the excitation light is that algae is actually moving up through the tissues and about to expel. So even though I can't see it under natural light, I can look at it under fluorescence and know that this coral is in jeopardy. It's going to bleach. And the purpose of that, being able to have an earlier warning sign, is really about monitoring. It's monitoring which corals um, from start to finish are surviving the bleaching event, are bleaching and then coming back, or are dying. And these are ones that, that we pick from in order to grow in nurseries and replant on wild reef systems. And that's part of what we do. And if anybody wants to, <laughs> wants to geek out about fluorescence with me, I'm happy to do that anytime. But th there is more to it about attracting algae back. Fluorescence has all these um, functions that we just have no idea. So we use this research to, again, inspire students. So this is in our wet lab. And this is a young lady who's looking at a fluorescent coral. So there's a coral under the microscope. Uh, the, the proteins have been excited and she's looking at it with the filter. And so all of a sudden this young lady 
is seeing a whole world of color that you don't see with the naked eye. And I mean, both kids and adults alike are, are wowed by this. And it's kind of a sneaky tactic to get them excited. It's like, look at this thing, it glows in the dark, glows in the light. You can see it you know, with, the, with uh, the special lights and they get very excited. And that's one way to try and inspire that awe so they grow up and want to conserve it. So the last thing we did when we were in Jerusalem was we sat down with everybody from both the zoo and the aquarium and we talked about doing joint research. So basically, I can take the design that we've created here and we've, we've um, built here and I can plop it down in Jerusalem. I can set it up for them and they can just continue the research there like we're doing here. Um, that's amazing for me because then I have access to this Red Sea Coral, which would be amazing. But it's amazing for them because it's very important um, for zoos and aquariums to, to, to use their animals, not only for education, in my opinion, but also um, non-invasive research. If there's a way that we can learn from these animals, that's what we should be doing. So we're looking at setting up a lab there in Jerusalem in continuing uh, the research there as well. COVID's kind of put a uh, uh, kink in the plans as with everything else, but, but we will get there. So from Jerusalem, we went down uh, to a lot. So we went down to the coast, we went down to the Sea of Aqaba. This is not the Sea of Aqaba, this is the Dead Sea. So this is on the way. And if you have ever been to Israel or you ever get the opportunity or Jordan, um, you should go to the Dead Sea. It was one of the wildest things I've ever experienced. And I've swam in oceans all over the place. Never been creeped out by anything. Sharks don't scare me. I don't care what's swimming under me. Here's this sea where there's nothing living in it except maybe some tardigrades. And I was completely creeped out by it. The fact that there was nothing swimming under me, I didn't like it. I got in, I floated, and I got right back out. So I just, you should do it though. It's, it's very, very interesting. So this is much more my type of sea. <laughs> this, is, this is more my cup of tea. This is in a lot. And the structure that you see under the water there is all reef structure. So that is coral that you're seeing. This was really unique for me. This was the first time I was at an ocean in the desert. So that was a lot of fun. And the Red Sea actually is quite a bit saltier uh, than any other of the salt, saltwater bodies of water globally. So this is what it looks like under the water. And so this is in the Sea of Aqaba and you can see some of that biodiversity. Um, as I said, hardiest coral in the world. Now where we were diving was pretty touristy area because it's right, you shore dive. So it's you walk in the water and go dive. Um, but that part of the, the sea is very narrow. So essentially from where we were diving, I could see Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Egypt while standing in Israel. So it's really just amazing. Um, but even though this was, it was sure, it's not gonna be that much different because you don't have, you can't go out 300 miles, you know, to, to dive or 200 miles or whatever it may be. So there was some beautiful, healthy coral. This is a Pacillopora. It's gorgeous purple. I think it's gorgeous to me, this is gorgeous. Uh, and there was some really healthy coral um, but, and I apologize, I'm probably gonna make you a little seasick. Um, there was a lot that was not healthy. Um, what you are seeing in this video is fairly common now when you go dive a reef system. There's a lot of coral rubble, there's a lot of dead coral, and there's a lot of bleaching coral. And I'm sorry, it seems to be glitching, but when I turn around this boulder, <laughs> you'll see some coral that are kind of half bleached, half not bleached. And that's the process of bleaching. And unfortunately, even what you're seeing in the foreground there, that yellow, it's not, it's not actually coral. It's called fire coral and it will sting the crud out of you if you accidentally brush against it. So this was very disheartening for me to see in a lot in the Red Sea that a lot of this coral was just not healthy and not alive, which just made me want to conserve more, just work harder, um, work smarter. And so 
one of the things that I brought back from Israel uh, was coral. No, I'm just kidding. I did not do that. One of the things that I brought back was um, some ideas for students here in our region and what we can do to help get kids really excited about the ocean. So this is the underwater observatory in a lot and it is an open water aquarium and it's absolutely amazing. Uh, but they do something there that um, if I could do it here, I would be the happiest person in the world. They have every sixth grader in a lot comes to the aquarium and fragments a piece of coral. So all of these were what's called microfragmenting. It's cut off, it's asexually reproduced from a larger coral sample and they grow that coral for a year. And then they plant that coral on a wild reef system. So talk about engagement. Um, they're, they're, in, they're invested in their reef. Um, and I think that there are things that we can do here. Uh, the planting of the milkweeds and the monarchs, that's a wonderful example. Getting students involved in doing things um, like they plant it, that's, that's an investment. Um, from an aquarium standpoint, obviously we can't run out on a reef and plant coral, but we can. what we can do is take coral into the classroom when COVID is, we've gotten past this, this um, blip in history, but um, we can bring coral into the classroom. Kids can grow coral there, and then we can share those coral with aquarium throughout the world. We can ship them to aquarium everywhere, which helps reduce the need to take coral from the wild. So there's still a direct impact. And then these kids can have pictures of this coral for years and years and years. And, and that's something I really, I really strive to do here because at the end of the day, for me, what it's all about is promoting what everybody in this group is, is passionate about and that's sustainability. Because without that, without sustainable society, we can't keep reefs the way they are now. We can't, there's so many ecosystems that just can't continue to thrive uh, unless we take better care. Um, so this is a healthy coral. This is inside of the aquarium actually there in a lot. But you can see there's lots of different colors. It's very beautiful. Um, even more beautiful is this is, is fluorescent coral. <laughs> so this is what got me into it was seeing this for the first time. Um, coral fluoresce like this, it, it just kind of blew my mind and made me want to learn everything that I possibly could about coral, so much so that I decided to go back to grad school in my 40s with three kids, which was insane. And I look back on it now and I'm glad I had no idea what that was going to actually mean. Um, but I don't regret a single moment of it, but, but it was definitely a lot. Uh, a lot, no pun intended. So on a final note, one thing that I just thought was so amazing is while we were there in a lot, the uh, Israel, the city of a lot, and it, for the first time in Israel, banned disposable plastics on beaches. And that this paper came out while we were there in a lot. And I just thought that was one of the coolest things ever. And it was just very apropos from, for our visit. So guys, thank you so much. I, like I said, I will talk coral, I will talk fluorescence all day long. If people are interested in, in learning more, if you want to know more about the, the education portion of the research that we do, I'm happy to share that. I'm happy to, to talk about and share anything that we're doing here at the aquarium. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. And you can come and I'll be happy to show you around and give you a tour. Do I have to? Great, thank you so much, Anne. I just uh, learned so much from you and um, always inspired by your passion for conservation and you make it so accessible to understand. And so thank you for spending your time with us today. And I'm sure, Sarah, we probably received a couple questions and uh, have you sent those on to Anne or? Uh, okay, great. So. And, and, and continue to, to post questions if you have them, but and if you want to um, continue to your presentation by answering some questions, that'd be great. Absolutely, so I'm looking right now, do, 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 do. Um, let's see. 
So what can Tulsans do to help protect the reefs by their actions? Uh, what I tell people when they come here, the number one thing that people can do is stop using disposable plastics. That's the, that's the easiest thing to do. Just knock out the, those disposable plastics. And the other thing that I would say is definitely choosing sustainable seafood. Um, actually, Rick Kotorski just told me that their sustain the Monterey Bay Sustainable Seafood um, uh, project is, is suffering right now with COVID, but they do have materials out there and they have on their website, or at least they did, where you can pick choices, green, yellow, red, green is good to go, sustainable, uh, yellow, and maybe not, and red is don't eat it. It's not, it's not sustainable at all. Um, yeah, there, there's resources there from their website, but uh, you can go on any smartphone and download a uh, sustainable seafood app which is highly recommended. It uh, updates constantly and you can refer to that at any point, at any place you're at in research, anywhere, and it'll tell you if that uh, fish is sustainably uh, farmed or caught. Although if you don't mind really quick, I'm gonna tell you a very, very quick antidote about going to Reesers and trying to ask whether the fish they had was sustainable. This was a few years ago and they had a monk fish on ice and I, I went up and I asked where the monkfish came from. And the guy looked at me like I was kind of crazy. And, and he said, what do you mean? I said, well, where did it come from? And he goes, off a truck in the back? And I went, never mind, it's okay, forget I asked. But, uh, but I, I'm sure it's better now. But that, that was, like I said, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, let's see, I wish the state government hadn't banned Oklahoma. Oh yeah. I wish the state government hadn't banned Oklahoma municipalities from banning or limiting plastics. Um, yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I, I, to me, it's, it's just crazy because if you look at it from a, a, a financial standpoint, if you, if you look at the big box stores, the, the Walmarts, the targets, if they were to stop using disposable uh, bags. First of all, it would cost them so much less money. They wouldn't have to buy them and they would make money. All you have to do is put, everybody forgets their bags in the car, right? You put a rack at each checkout of disposable bags. They would make so much money. It's just, it's just silly to me that, that um, people look at it as not financially um, feasible. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing a trend of younger people getting involved in coral conservation? The program at the Jerusalem Aquarium seems awesome and I'm wondering if the industry is seeing returns on those activities. Um, so yes, the answer to that question, the, the first portion of the question is, is yes, you do have more and more um, young people who are going into school that are studying coral. There's a lot more um, financial resources available as well. There's a lot, a lot more grants um, because we're kind of in a race right now. And uh, one of the things that that even just in the, the six years since I really started this research, there's been a complete shift in the way that the research happens and is communicated. Um, people are working together so much more. They're integrating their research. They're bringing those projects together because what we know is that coral reef health doesn't, it's not about one thing. It's not about the coral animal. It's not even just about the algae, although it is a lot about the algae, but it's, it's about so many, it's about sea surface rise and sea surface temperature increase. And, and it's all these different things. And so people are starting to work together way more than I even saw at the beginning of starting this research. And definitely I, um, I get a lot of, uh, questions from local university students and high school students contacting me saying, I want to get a degree in marine biology. I'd like to work with coral. How can I go about that? And there are very few marine biology uh, programs in the state of Oklahoma. Dr. Korstad, I think you have about the only one. Um, so my recommendation is always, if you're going to a different university, take as many science classes as you can, and then you're gonna to have to go to grad school to really study study coral. Um, but I definitely get a lot more questions about that than I, than I previously have. So that's really encouraging. 
Um, and is the industry seeing returns on the activities? Um, I don't know the, the answer to that question, to be honest with you. I think that um, definitely across the board, aquariums are um, being more recognized for, for the research that they do. It's always been happening. Um, Monterey Bay, the shed, these, these really long standing, amazing aquariums have whole research arms that are doing things that would just blow your mind. And I think one of the problems and one of the reasons I wanna do things like this is that people don't realize these things are happening. The Georgia Aquarium does incredible manta ray research and you'd never know because it's not really publicized um, so more getting more people to talk about what's going on, the research projects that are happening uh, at zoos and aquariums is so important. Um, okay, what is the uh, status of coral reefs being protected and what is the trend and predictions? Um, so the status of reefs is that, like I said, right now about 50% of our coral are gone, but what we're seeing now is more marine protected areas and that's definitely um, a positive and definitely helping. But the biggest issue for coral reefs is temperature. And so, I, you know, we're not gonna start, stop releasing carbon tomorrow, CO2, and that's what's increasing the, the temperature of the oceans. Now, having said that, um, about three, let's see, three years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that coral reefs could be functionally extinct by 2050. We had the, the largest bleaching event from 2015 to 2017, and they came back and said they might be gone by 2030 or functionally extinct. I don't believe that because what's happening now since those predictions came out is you have so many researchers that are dedicating themselves to figuring out the best coral to grow, the best coral to replant. I think that the biodiversity is going to change of the coral themselves. The biodiversity that you see on reefs is, is going to be somewhat different, um, but coral are 500 million years old. Uh, they are really amazing evolutionary uh, evolutionary animals. Um, so it's it, I, I try to to let people know enough to know it is very very serious, but also there is hope. There is most definitely hope, and um, don't give up on it because uh, we're already seeing improvements just from having so many more people focused on doing this. Um, this sort of work, uh, we're, we're already seeing improvements. So that's really good. Oh, Dr. Cornstead's talking about our internship program, um, which I love. I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm in between projects right now, so I don't have the, the, the research where I can have interns come in and help with that, but I can always take interns to help with our sustainability plug. <laughs> If you guys have anything else you want to ask me, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me outside of this. I'm, I'm happy to, to chat with you. I love it. Okay, thank you so much, Anne. I, again, uh, our, our doctor, um, <laughs> Money here, uh, we just really always learn a lot. And that was a, a good reminder. You know, we feel, you know, we're not, uh, connected directly to the ocean right here. I guess indirectly we are through um, the Arkansas River, um, mm -hmm. but um, you know what we can do and the single use plastics is a good reminder, helps on so many different levels and uh, reducing carbon uh, output uh, to help with, with that as well. Those are two things we can do here that I heard from you and uh, I know we definitely promote that in our Oklahoma Green Living page. There's options there and our speakers continue to share some of those options too. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I wanted to, uh, and again, uh, thank you for also offering to take more questions from folks and, and as well. So um, I wanted to, um, just said I, we're wrapping up here and in just a second we'll just take off our our mics to say hello but before that i wanted to announce the winner of the recharge tickets and that is tom and i'm gonna hopefully i'm gonna say this right Mortzitz. if i'm saying that right tom if you're still there uh i i see you're still on but i i 
Um, but uh, we'll get in touch with you. But congratulations, Tom, uh, for for that. And um, we'll, uh, it's going to be a great event. If you didn't uh, win today uh, or uh, check out all those silent auction items, some great stuff there. I think um, Megan will probably post in there again how to connect with that. Pam did earlier. So uh, again, Pam Taylor, do you, if you're still there, do you have a, a little quick announcement you want to make about recharge or, or just uh, uh, to encourage people uh, to be with us? I can't tell if you're still there. There you are. I'm Pam. still here. Yeah, I am. Uh, I would really love to encourage everybody to attend our annual fundraiser. We're going to have a lot of fun, going to talk a lot about the different programs we have and uh, um, really try to recharge everyone's spirits for sustainability. Uh, the auction opened today. Uh, what great items we have, not just great, unique Tulsa local uh, items, but we have fun experiences. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please check out our silent auction and uh, I was uh, looking at it, going through. Uh, some of it even surprised me. We had some last minute stuff come in. So um, yeah, if you like to have some fun, unique gifts for your friends or just have a, an interesting experience uh, virtually, uh, check it out. Thank, thank you, Pam. Appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun and, and uh, it helps us uh, support our programs throughout the year. So we'd love to have you there with us. Again, I want to thank our sponsors for today, American Waste Control, Cavanta, Grog Screen Barn, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Air Assistance, TCC, uh, PSO and PSO Wind Choice. Um, your support is why we can continue to do this. Thank you so much. And thank you all for making time to attend today. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you for Recharge. And then we'll be back for First Thursday in October. It's um, looking forward to that uh, presentation. So look for that in your, your email uh, there as well. And um, I think uh, Megan will be sending out um, a survey to get some more information from you. We're really trying to figure out how we can improve this online experience for you. And uh, so we will continue to take your comments and, and how we can do that. So again, Dr. Money, thank you so much. Let's give her a virtual round of applause. Um, if you, can you hear us? <laughs> um, but everyone, unmic yourself and say hello. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. So say hello to someone uh, before you head out. All right. Take care, everyone.